I take this for my professor, so um, if you don't want to be on video, just beware. So thank you guys for having me. Um, I hope I wore enough cover-up today because I tend to get really bright red when I speak in front of people. Um, not my favorite thing to do. So um, what I wanted to talk about today is an interdisciplinary care model in a residential psychiatric unit um, and its impact on executive function. So I'll kind of break that down and what it all means, but first kind of tell you how I got here. So like Dulcinea said, I graduated with the class of 2011. I had an undergraduate degree in environmental science and thought I wanted to um, change my career. I wanted to work in trauma. I wanted to deliver babies. Psych was the last thing I wanted to do. Um, I actually remember with Eileen, I was standing between the locked doors at Holy Family. Have you guys been there yet for your vacation? Um, this group isn't going there. Oh, they're not? <laughs> I actually thought I was going to have my own little panic attack standing between these two doors. Um, I was like, this is not for me. I ended up a weekend loving psych nursing and have been doing it ever since. So um, it was the best thing I ever did. So I did, immediately after school, I did two years at Franciscan Hospital for Children. Um, they're actually run by McLean Hospital, which is one of the best psych hospitals in the country. So it was a really great opportunity for me. Excuse me. I was there for two years, and then I moved on to um, Lakey Health Behavioral Services, and I've been there for four. My role there is really um, unique and has been kind of a challenge. I was kind of a department of one for my first two years, and as a rookie nurse, that's kind of a scary thing to be. Um, so I'm a program nurse there, which means I'm currently overseeing a 27-student therapeutic day school and a 13-bed um, intensive group home. So that's part of my role. My other part is I sit on the leadership team there. So. Um, our leadership team is like a multidisciplinary group that kind of guides policies and makes decisions for the program. And then we also rotate um, within the division, all the nurses kind of rotate um, on call duties. So, definitely been a challenge. So today, my goals um, for today, by the end of the presentation, I want you guys to be able just to kind of understand what the interdisciplinary care model is and how it impacts, um, the positive impacts it has on executive functioning goals. And I'll kind of explain what I mean by that in just a minute. I also want you to be able to identify the challenges and obstacles of this model of care and explain how it relates to us in, in um, healthcare and nursing. So does anyone have um, experience with residential care? Has anyone worked in a, you have? So in New Hampshire or Mass? Uh, Mass in California. Okay, yeah. so they're all I don't know, there's multiple different types of programs out there. Um, so I kind of want to just give you an idea of the one that we're focusing on today. So we've got 13 beds. We have a three to one staffing ratio. And this is a home in Massachusetts, actually. There's a little bit of difference between New Hampshire and Mass as far as regulations go. Um, so for every three youth, we have one staff on the floor. Our therapeutic day school is right on site. Not all of our kids go to our school. Some of them go out to other therapeutic schools. They might go to the regional high school um, or they stay on campus with us. And that's really determined by their funding sources um, or just their needs. So we have youth 13 to 19, both boys and girls, and um, we're funded by the Caring Together Initiative, which actually started in 2014 and changed our model of care pretty dramatically. Um, the goal of the Caring Together initiative was to kind of pool together Department of Mental Health and Department of Children and Families um, resources, and it's been a little controversial. Seeing these two groups brought together, um, there's a lot of commonalities. Both groups of kids have history of trauma, history of neglect, um, haven't been successful in school, might kind of feel like they don't fit in. Um, but back in the day, we had all of our kids, all 13 vets were filled by kids with diagnosed mental health issues. So we were seeing schizophrenia, bipolar, borderline personality. Um, and now the shift has been where we've seen kids who just have been yanked from their home or they've just had severe neglect. So our risk behaviors 
has changed pretty dramatically. So we've gone from seeing a lot of cutting and headbanging, suicidal gestures, to now we're seeing kids go on the run, substance abuse, um, sexual activity, even gang affiliation. So the risk and liability on the floor has shifted quite dramatically. Good and bad from that. The good thing is that um, it's kind of forced us to take a more holistic approach and really look at what's going on with these kids from all angles. Um, and because of that, we've been able to kind of integrate occupational therapy, nursing, social work, um, and attack their care plans from all different angles. I think the bad side is that we are seeing a lot of homes that are having to shut down because maintaining the expectations of the <coughs> initiative and keeping kids safe and staff staffing for safety has been um, quite a challenge. So real quick, just um, our care model. So, so you worked in, you said New Hampshire and California or Massachusetts? You know, I actually did have New Hampshire experience. So okay. So sometimes you see um, different programs that do level systems or um, point systems. We don't come at it from that approach. Um, we basically use natural consequences. So it's not a punitive system. However, just like at home, if you come home and you don't do your homework, your parent might say you're not going out shopping with your friends. Um, so that's kind of the approach that we take. And we're also very focused on relationships and trauma-informed care. Trauma-informed care basically is um, the belief that every single one of us comes to the table with some level of trauma in our life, and that it's not what defines us, but it's something that happens to us. Um, I even like to kind of take that one step further and not look at it as something that happened to them, but something that they've been through. It kind of. To me, that kind of has more of a survivor feel than a victim feel. Um, but those are definitely two of the um, principles that our care model is based on. So our clinical team consists of um, our clinical social workers, which are going to be your um, therapists, your LICSWs, your LMHCs. They're probably different in Mass in New Hampshire, I think. So, yeah, the same. They have the same titles. Are they? Yeah. Um, your occupational therapist nursing and behavioral support and then also I don't have them on the list but we can't forget like your direct care staff your front line they're your soldiers that are pretty much doing um, the toughest work when I first titled my project um, I kept using the word multidisciplinary and then realized after doing all this research that I was completely using the wrong term um, does anybody know the difference between multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary because they are often used um, interchangeably. Wouldn't multi be like bringing in like in medical or like something like not associated with this, the realm of psych and residential? Yep, actually both kind of do. So both of the terms um, are drawing on different areas of expertise. The only difference is that in multidisciplinary, it's kind of an additive process. So like I might take information from occupational therapy and then build it into my nursing plan and then I'll pass my nursing plan on to social work and they might build it into their therapy plan. Um, with an interdisciplinary approach, the plans are kind of being synthesized all together. It's kind of like a synergistic um, process. So we're actually sitting down as a team and kind of building these goals. Doesn't mean we don't have our own care plans individually, but in general, we're getting together and we're kind of making changes and formulating um, our care plans as a team. So pretty much the true form of collaboration. How about executive function? I chose executive function because typically when we think about things in um, psych, we think about symptoms, diagnoses, um, but we don't often look at executive function. How about that word? Does anybody know what executive function is? Because I had no clue until I worked with an occupational therapist. Okay, perfect. Can you guys read that? Are you guys able to see the words in white? Yes, some of them. All right, so we've got error processing, behavioral control, use of rules, risk and reward decisions, emotions, and reactions and responses. And I think in the middle, we've got working memory. What do these things have in common?
What do we need them for? I would say like interpreting the environment. Good. Um, actually, very good. So yeah, so we need these things pretty much to keep us safe, to function in every level of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. We need them for activities of daily living. We need them to be able to go out to a restaurant, um, to sit down and order a meal, to um, go to school and function appropriately in society. So executive function is a set of cognitive processes that underlie all of our goal-directed behaviors. <coughs> that's believed to be orchestrated by the prefrontal cortex of the brain. And currently the prominent theoretical framework is one of unity and diversity of executive function. So basically, the belief is that these are all interrelated processes, um, but yet they have their distinct components. To me, that is in support of the use of interdis um, interdisciplinary models of care because you want to be coming at these kids from all different angles and trying to build up these skill sets. The cool thing about executive function is that children are not born with these skills. They are born with the developed potential them, to develop them, sorry. So if they're not born with them, how are these skills being developed? As in nature versus nurture? Yep, so they're getting them from their environment, they're getting them from their family members. Um, so really the quality of their environment and their relationships with others is impacting the architecture of their brain. So for a teenager, let's think about what your average teenager does with their friends or in the community, what kind of things do they need strong executive functioning skills for? These can be pretty basic. Decision making. Mm -hmm. So some of the ones I put up here are activities of daily living or self-care, schoolwork, just being able to sit still long enough to get their homework done or even making the decision um, to do their homework, participating in a group appropriately, um, going shopping, budgeting, um, opening a bank account is a big one that we often work on with these kids. Um, going on community outings, and applying for a job, completing a resume, that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of things that these kids really need to work on um, while they're in residential care. I'm actually going to skip this slide. I was going to have us try to kind of collaborate and figure out um, how each discipline would come together. Um, in each of these scenarios. And these are all real-time scenarios that we've had over the last probably year or two years. Um, but I'm going to come back to this if we have time. And you guys should have a handout in front of you that has the individual roles of the nurse, the OT, and the social worker. If you can take a quick look at that. So I had no experience with an occupational therapist before working at Leahy. If I have any suggestion to you as a nurse, any words of wisdom, is make friends with your OT because they have their hands in every single aspect of patient's care and they know so much. Um, for me, my OT has been extremely helpful in, she's typically the first person that notices side effects of medication because um, she does so much work around muscular control, speech, um, She's, I can't even tell you, like she, she's been invaluable to me. So she has on a number of occasions come to me and said, you know, I think we have something going on, whether it's lithium toxicity or withdrawal because they've missed a couple doses of medication. Um, so it's been really helpful. The one thing you'll notice about um, the words that I highlighted on that handout is that every single one of us have our hands in safety, recognizing patterns, um, reaching out to other agencies, so our jobs at times really do overlap. So I wanted to discuss a youth named, I will call him PJ, and hopefully not blurt out his real name. Um, I changed my case study at the last minute because we got a phone call the other day talking about just how extremely successful this kid has been. 
And when he first got referred to us, I fought his admission tooth and nail. And I'll be the first person to say I was wrong by doing so. But on paper, he was a nightmare. He was so medically complicated and psychiatrically complicated. I didn't think we could handle him. Or maybe I didn't think I could handle him. Um, and fortunately, I was wrong, and he's actually doing really well. So he came to us, PJ came to us as a 17-year-old high school senior. He identified as Portuguese, Italian, Greek, Native American, and um, was always really into kind of learning more about his descent. So that was pretty cool. He was English speaking, he identified as Catholic and as asexual. He was coming to us after three, after being, he was in an inpatient unit and then he had three other hospitalizations and two outpatient therapists since 2013. His primary um, symptoms at the time of admission were significant psychosis, um, anxiety, depression, and adjustment status post-trauma. Now with PJ, the, his trauma was not necessarily um, one particular incident. His trauma was a series of intermittent neglect from mom. So mom had struggled with her own mental illness and own substance use history. Um, so she was kind of in and out of his life um, for quite some time. So even though they had this amazing friendship that you notice right away when you see them together, there was also a lot of resentment. So. PJ lived at home with mom and grandparents, um, which was an interesting dynamic because the grandparents were also the parents that had been slightly abusive and neglectful to mom. So it was kind of this chain that we were seeing. Um, but they were also at a point, I think, where they were all willing to get help. So in the case where we kind of try to approach everything from relationship-based um, you know, model, they were all invested. The whole family was invested in care, so that was great. Um, he was had positive homicidal ideation towards mom and also towards his best friend. And PJ was also suicidal because he felt he was a bad person in the eyes of God. And he had become extremely hyper-religious um, and was very wrapped up in always wanting to be a good person and do the right thing. Now, the one thing um, that is probably the most important thing in his history is that his psychosis became extremely um, increased after a rejection from his biological father. So he was estranged from his dad and reached out to his father on Facebook. Dad decided he didn't want anything to do with him, he would not accept his friendship, and at that point was when PJ kind of fell apart, ending up um, hospitalized. So that was a huge trauma piece for him. At intake, now I don't know, do you guys still, um, do you guys still teach the access, multi-access system? I do. You do? Mm -hmm. Even yeah. though they don't use it. I yeah, if you, so, if you're, so tell them, right? If you're in real psych, you still use it? You still see it, because <laughs> you're going to see like their medical histories and it's still going to be in there. So, um, now this was 2013 when he came to us, so he was still being diagnosed under dsm 4 so his Axis 1 and Axis 2, which would be his um, psych diagnosis and his personality and cognitive disorders. Um, he had schizophrenia, catatonic, disorganized, and paranoid features. He had a reading, writing, learning disability, and expressive language disorder. His IQ was at an 80, which would put him into the dull category, which I hate that word, but um, that's where it put him. Now, this is a very abbreviated list of his medical issues. Um, I tried to kind of just point out the main stuff on here, but when I first saw his medical page, I, my mind was kind of blown. And we don't have um, nursing all around the clock, so I was a little concerned. So he came to us with mild akinesia, history of intermittent leg spasms. He was a little bit overweight, high cholesterol. He had trouble swallowing, which actually was secondary to the double aortic arch. He had a Chiari malformation, which was the first time I had ever really had to deal with that. He had constipation, headaches, asthma, and acne. So, have you taught Chiari malformation? No, can you say, I don't remember what that is either. So, um, I was kind of baffled when I first got this, and the more I learned about it, it presents very differently in different people. So, if you look at the first picture of the brain up here, you can see the cerebellum is pretty normal right here. Over here, we got brain tissue that's coming down into the spinal column. 
So a cerebellum is actually below the foramen magnum. Um, in some people, this has like huge neurological impact. Um, he was pretty much asymptomatic other than the headaches. Um, he was also born, oh, the reason he had this was he was born with um, flathead or um, plagiocephaly, I forget what it's called, De yeah. deformational plagiocephaly. So he had um, helmet therapy um, as a kid. He also was born with a congenital heart condition that had resolved by age four. And then I think in 2012, they discovered the double aortic arch. Um, so that was actually causing him to have problems swallowing, which was one of my biggest concerns was having him choke when there's no nursing um, around. So he had a lot going on. As far as medications, I'm not gonna spend too much time on it because it's not really pertinent to what we're doing. Um, but you can see he was on Abilify, Zyprexa, Cogentin, Buspar, and Metformin. He was in the past very sensitive to medication, so it was either over-sedating for him um, or he had pretty dramatic side effects. So our immediate concerns for PJ were his ongoing suicidal and homicidal ideation. Um, now obviously these were secondary to his psychosis. He was hearing manned hallucinations, um, auditory hallucinations telling him to hurt mom. He was also a risk for runaway. He would um, be found kind of aimlessly walking his community. He also had disordered eating patterns. Um, because of his hyper-religiosity, he felt like he didn't want to be a glutton. So he, was, he would get really wrapped up and caught up in that. Sleep disturbance. Um, lots of intrusive thoughts, racing thoughts. Um, and also at home, he didn't really have a sleep hygiene routine, and mom didn't really have much structure in place. So his sleep disturbance was pretty significant. He had moments of catatonia, which um, through the years of him being treated, everybody has labeled it as catatonia. He denies that that's what it truly was. Um, it does, however, in him, looked very similar to his moments of prayer. So he would get very upset when this word was tossed around. Um, he also was a risk for choking and would need significant neurological follow-ups for the Chiari malformation and um, was pre-diabetic. So PJ was really good at setting long-term goals. He kind of knew what he wanted. So. Between PJ and the team, our long-term goals were to minimize his medication, to address his symptoms of depression, anxiety, and trauma. He wanted to graduate high school, attend college, or get into the workforce. And really important to him was to building, um, was for him to build life skills for independent living. Even though he had this great relationship with mom, he still had this resentment and really wanted to kind of become confident in himself that he didn't need to rely on mom anymore. And the awesome thing that I still, I think this is, was so important in his success is that PJ's social life, um, his group of friends at home were fantastic. They were all really supportive of him through his mental illness. He even at one point told his best friend he had a homicidal ideation towards him and his best friend came at it from an angle of understanding and just wanted him to get better. Um, it was a pretty incredible thing to see. So looking at his executive functioning deficits and what his needs were, PJ was a very hands-on learner. Because of his learning disabilities, he had to do things um, to learn them. He became a little obsessive around the food and the exercise and religion. And in a minute, we'll talk about one of his interventions that um, was a little, we were a little unsure if we were doing the right thing because it involved exercise. Um, so we'll get there in a second. He wasn't able to follow multiple step tasks. So for him to follow a recipe and to cook a meal, huge challenge. Um, again, poor sleep hygiene, no routine at home. He had slow response times. Um, when speaking to him, there's a couple reasons for this. Could be medication, could also just be his diagnosis of schizophrenia, but he also always wanted to process what he was about to say because he was so caught up in being a good person and doing the right thing. So there was a couple things going on for him there. He also had trouble choosing his leisure activities and we definitely saw some poor self-esteem. So obviously 
as a team, we could see that PJ had a ton of strengths and weaknesses in all different areas. So how did we go about tackling this from a team approach? We had treatment team meetings twice weekly. So our treatment team was multidisciplinary. So we had nursing, OT, clinical, and floor staff. And some of your best information actually came from your floor staff because they can really give you the ins and outs of you know, behaviors and quotes and things that have been said. Um, so this was a great meeting where everybody, all minds kind of came together. Quarterly reports. So clinical OT and nursing all would do their own quarterly reports. And then at our quarterly meetings, we would get together with family and any agencies involved. So that would either be DMH or DCF. Um, and at those meetings, those goals would get shared, combined, and that's where everything kind of came together um, synergistically. Med clinic took place at least once a month um, if we felt there was an acute need. Otherwise, they could be seen more often. Um, but we had a consulting psychiatrist on grounds every, I think it was every Wednesday for him. Um, and then our follow-ups with nursing, our occupational therapy, and social work were kind of built into our safety planning and our quarterly um, goals and reports. So, PJ today. So we get a call the other day. Um, PJ graduated from our high school. He ex got accepted to Job Corps, which had been his goal the entire time. Um, completed the carpenter program and is now actually a union carpenter, probably making more than most of us in this room. <laughs> um, he's running road races. He's off his met foreman for his weight and has held at a steady, healthy weight. He's had a girlfriend, this is the best part. He's had a girlfriend for two years. Now remember, this was the boy that identified himself as asexual. And this was a completely unsanctioned relationship. It was with another youth who, another girl in our therapeutic school. But behind closed doors, we all were like, we really want this to work, we really want it to work. Because they were the cutest, sweetest couple we've ever seen. Um, and they've been able to maintain healthy boundaries. They had like supervised visits outside of um, school and outside of the residence. And they are still dating strong today. So um, rumor has it they're coming back to see our class this year graduate. Um, and PJ actually may be speaking at our graduation, so that would be really cool. Oh, and he also drives a car, which blows my mind, but um, so it's pretty cool. He has a great relationship now with mom. Um, he and mom are back to being best buds. They communicate really well um, and has communication with dad, which mom states at this point is a healthy kind of, um, you know, they see each other. I think they've gotten together. Um, occasionally, it's not something that happens all the time, but it's something that all parties are comfortable with. So to me, that's a huge success. So how did we get him there? Some of the interventions, and I guess as we're going through the interventions, just kind of think about who would be initiating these interventions. Sometimes it's hard to tell. Um, some of these came from nursing, some of them came from clinical, and some came from OT. But the number one thing that was most important in his success was developing a shared language for him and mom to communicate. Mom often used the terms catatonic or dissociative. It drove him insane. He couldn't, he couldn't handle those words. So they worked um, pretty hard with the therapist to develop words that were meaningful and safe to them um, and allowed a system so that they could have check-ins at home um, to kind of figure out where, where he was at and what he was feeling. Because of his um, learning disabilities, he wasn't always able to find words to explain how he felt, but intensity scales were fantastic for him. So you can give him a scale of zero to 10, saying, where's your anxiety at? How are you feeling? 10 being the worst. And he could easily say, I'm at a six, I'm at a three. Um, again, we worked on developing the skills that allowed him to feel more grown up, like working on following a recipe, making a grocery list, um, cooking a meal. We had an emotional tracking log. He would be the first person to say that often his feeling didn't match up with the thoughts going through his head. So um, we used the tracking log to kind of figure out where he, how those things matched up and what kind of patterns were presenting. He started volunteering at Habitat for Humanity. Um, we started a running plan. This is the one that was kind of controversial because he had been a little bit obsessive at times. Um, 
However, we discovered very quickly that running became such a coping skill for him, and he came back so much more clear. He would use it when rooms got too loud or he got overstimulated. He'd say, I need to go on my run. He'd go on a run, he'd come back, and he would be able to um, you know, collect himself and get back to baseline. So this was actually a cool plan because it started out also as um, a way for him to build independence. So he started by running, I think he was doing a half mile with a staff member. They'd go out a half mile, come back, and he was doing this for a couple weeks. Eventually, um, he also wanted to get a cell phone. So we built a cell phone plan into that where he would be able to take his cell phone, he would run independently. He had, I think, two or three routes that he was allowed to take, um, and he'd have his phone on him for safety, and it was a way of him earning trust with us. Um, and it worked out fantastically, and now he's running road races, he's maintaining a healthy um, weight, and we haven't seen any um, restriction in his food intake. So I'll take that as a success. Um, and also building shared activities for him and mom. Again, we did a lot of vocational training. He definitely wanted to do stuff with his hands, so he was working with our um, transitional coordinator to do things like building bookcases, building shelves. He also was helped through the Job Corps tour and application process, went on multiple college campus visits, had med clinic once weekly, sorry, once monthly. Um, and then we also did a lot of work on helping mom parent at home. Um, mom would often get caught up in being friends, so it was difficult for her to kind of lay down rules and stick to them. So there was a lot of work done with her about building in some structure into the home, and um, she actually did fantastic. Leisure book. Leisure book was a big OT thing, so um, it seems kind of silly and simple, but sometimes kids can't make up their mind about what they want to do. Um, so OT worked with him to create a leisure book and pick activities that he really enjoyed doing at what times. Um, and it just made it easy and simple for him to look and go, you know what, I don't know what to do with myself right now. I'm going to you know, go to the gym or I'm going to go play with the dogs. Um, and also one of the other things that we have on site is a challenge course, which we, um, we use our philosophy as challenge by choice. You can only push yourself as hard as you want to be pushed. Um, and we noticed that PJ was always trying to kind of bring himself to the next level and always trying to push himself. So he was really building um, those skills that we needed him to work on. So he was learning decision making. He was able to assess risk. He was regulating his emotions and um, improving his working memory. So there's a lot of benefits to this approach to the collaborative care. What are some of the challenges that you would see working with other disciplines. If your what you want to do doesn't match up or is the opposite of what someone else in the discipline wants to do. Yep, perfect. That's a huge one. What else? So for me, my biggest one was sharing and communicating in the moment. So I might be with PJ and I observe, I'm trying to think of something. Um, he tells me that he was restricting food for the last 12 hours. And I'm with him, he ends up ending his time with me and going back to the residence and I get caught up doing something else. I might not always have that immediate ability to communicate. And that's kind of an important piece of information to communicate before he goes off on his running plan. Um, so for me, I think, being able to share and communicate information in the most timely fashion has been the biggest challenge. Disagreement with treatment plans. Um, I might not agree with what the therapist wants to do. Um, I might think that things are taking place for different reasons. We might have totally different perspectives, and that's okay. Um, I think as long as people are talking about it and we realize that everybody's coming from a good place and well-intentioned, um, we usually do find common ground. This is a huge one, and I think we always have to keep in mind that our floor staff is not always coming from a psych background. Um, they're unlicensed staff that don't get paid very much, and they have an extremely tough job with a lot of liability and a lot of responsibility, and they don't always understand why certain treatment plans are put in place. Um, it's not always the easiest thing for them to do, 
like for instance a lot of times they want to get kids out of the house they want to get them on shopping trips and they want to get them to do events because it maintains a calm environment sometimes it's not therapeutic for this child to go off on a shopping trip because they're actually pocketing you know cold medication um, and there might be reasons that there's a therapeutic plan in place that they might not agree with. So that's, that's actually one of the biggest challenges, I think, um, is having everybody be on the same um, team and having floor staff carry out the plans. Another big one is having family hold up their end of the bargain, um, especially with a mom who's got her own struggles and challenges and one day she might be manic, one day she might be very low. Um, having mom or family hold up their ends of the bargain. And then the sad thing is trying to let go. It's hard when you all work together as a team and you have this um, very much a wraparound approach and then you realize you have to transition this kid into a world where they're just him and mom. Um, that's kind of a challenge and it's you know a difficult thing I think to handle. So what does all this mean? Why did I choose this as my topic? Um, for PJ, most of his deficits came from a history of rejection and neglect. So our goal was to build his skill set and give him some more independence. Regardless of his diagnosis, regardless of his symptoms, we wanted to get him to a place where he can function in society and be your average teenager. Um, so it was the interdisciplinary care model that we actually were able to improve his executive function and now he's at home as functioning as a son, a grandson, a boyfriend, a carpenter. Um, you know, he's driving a car. Like these are all very normal things for a youth his age. So the last two slides are actually just referencing the two articles that I handed out. They're actually very similar. Um, but there's a couple things I wanted to point out. So there's a term, measurement-based treatment to target. So when I talked about treatment team and we were meeting twice a week and how that was where we kind of got together to discuss our successes, um, that's where we were able to make changes to our plan. So this measurement-based treatment to target, our, treat, our target being executive function, um, the term means that treatments are actively being changed until your target goal is met. So um, treatment team is a prime example of how we were able to do that. And this article talks about how it's that philosophy that we kind of need to move forward with um, in healthcare because we need to kind of transition from reactive treatment to preventative. Um, and often nowadays we see people come into their primary care doctors to get psychiatric treatment and they're often falling short if they're not reaching out to psychiatry and other specialties. Um, so they are falling short in their treatment sometimes. And my last slide talks about the triple aim, or actually I should say illustrates the triple aim. Have you guys heard of the triple aim? I don't think I heard of it until... So um, at Riviere, we constantly use the Institute for Healthcare Improvement um, website as a resource. There's tons of information on there just about quality improvement in healthcare, leadership. Um, I would recommend checking it out. There's just a lot of cool stuff and a lot of like free education on there. Um, but the triple aim is the goal in healthcare to move towards improving individual experience as well as improving our population health and reducing healthcare costs. So and these are all things that um, you know definitely need to move towards, whether it be in mental health or our overall healthcare system. So that is my presentation. Do you guys have any questions for me um, about the program or about PJ or anything at all? Yes, Dulcinea. Um, how long was that whole process then? He was admitted when he was 17 in March. Yep, and then he was there, so that was 2015, okay. and then he graduated in the class of 16. So he was there for one year. Wow, so he did all that in a he year. He did, and it was, that's why I ended up changing my case study at the last minute, because 
when I say I fought this admission tooth and nail, I went to the medical director at Leahy and I was like, there's no way we can handle him without nursing around the clock. And um, that's when they kind of had to school me on Chiari malformation and how like it's not that dramatic in most people. Um, and they really felt that we could take him on. And when he first got to us, he was his presentation was a little frightening. He was so, I think, scared to say anything that would be offensive or off-putting that he often would just stare at you with a flat affect. Um, by the time he left, he was joking. He was actually one of the funniest kids um, we had. He was always looking for opportunities to engage with his peers. Um, just a huge success. Like We all sobbed when he left because we were just like, we couldn't believe how far this kid had come. And he was definitely a shining example of how everybody came around this kid from different angles. So it was very cool. <clears throat> are these results like, like extraordinary or are these typical results for like the program that you're working with? I would say for him to make the progress that he made in a year, he's definitely an outlier as mm -hmm. far as like, that's why I kind of felt like I had to shift and focus on him. Um, but with that being said, I do think there's very few kids that I say leave our program that we have been disappointed in our outcomes. Um, and we definitely take this approach with most of our kids. I think with him, it just everything just fell together perfectly. Um, but the interdisciplinary care model is definitely our goal with each um, case that comes through. What's the average length of the program like, that you see most kids have to be in there for? Like you said, he was in a year, but is that like common for most kids, or is it different? It's changed over time, um, and it's pretty, there's a huge variety. A lot of the DCF kids that come in actually can get in, um, get in and out within a few months. Um, I would say on average, we're probably about 10 months to a year. And then it also depends on, too, like um, some of the kids have transitioned out of our residence and gone home, but then still come to the day school. Um, and they might spend their whole high school career at the therapeutic school. A lot of them don't want to be there for four years, um, but some of them do so well and they find success there and that feels good, so they'll stay. Do you have any thoughts on why the makeup of the school's population has changed from being more like how we would think of like traditional psych, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar, to some of the other. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, it's funny because at first when that whole like, like, <laughs> <laughs> right. So we used to all be like every single bed was Department of Mental Health, and even back then we were struggling to find beds for kids. Um, I think part of the problem was that there were so many kids being pulled from their homes or needing some kind of assistance and not having places to go, that they're like, hmm, let's pull these kids together and see if maybe that creates um, an opportunity to have more open beds. It didn't really work that way. <laughs> um, and I don't know, I've heard a lot of, a, a couple people who've actually worked for either one of the agencies kind of, when I hear them talk about it, they almost feel like it's actually pinned the agencies against each other a little bit more. Like they're kind of fighting for the same resources. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that was the intention. I think it was to kind of improve their opportunities. Um, but I think, I do think that with the shutting down of some programs that they are gonna have to s shift the model a little bit. Um, it's definitely changed the level of risk involved and so I think staffing ratios have to change and um, there's definitely a lot of room for improvement but I'm not actually sure exactly why they went to that choice um, but it has been in place since 2014 so I think they're still kind of in the years of trying to figure out is this really working or not so, great question though I just had a comment. I thought it was really interesting when you talked about one of the things he was doing previously was this like running away or wandering around and stuff, but you built on that as like, let's how do we make that into something positive where you can have that opportunity to run away, yeah. but it's sanctioned and it's approved and you're safe doing your running great. away. The thing that was great about him was that the one thing I think that was the key to his success is he was always willing to communicate. If he was having these horrible thoughts in his head, 
he would be able to say, I'm not that there would be a knife laying around, but like I'm staring at that knife over there and I'm thinking about stabbing my friend Joey. And that scared him so much and what it meant about him that he always was trying to communicate because he really wanted the help. So that was kind of his big thing. So when he started going, um, when we discovered that kind of going on these walks and going on these runs were super therapeutic for him, we kind of built that, we trusted him so much because of his communication abilities that we started out small and we just kind of let him earn his way up as far as trust goes. And he was on board, he never pushed it. Mm -hmm. um, if we asked him to be back, you know, only do a mile today, I know you want to do three, but just do one, um, he would go out and come back. And, um, he's just a really good kid. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, he gives me the, like, the warm and fuzzies when I think about it, because he really is mm -hmm. um, a unique case. Mm -hmm. so. Now, is that a, is that a 504.5? At a point five or point six, and they don't use the numbers anymore, right? Mm -mm. Yeah. Mm -mm. Like point six would be like the most restrictive, where you know you'd have the school in the. Oh, I don't even know. Yeah. I don't think they use them because. Yeah. I don't know that answer. Okay. See, I'm like way old. <laughs> when we'd be looking to discharge on impatience, and they would qualify for services like the higher the number, the more inclusive oh, yeah. it was. Like, so. Questions. They're a really super chatty group. <laughs> <laughs> and they just had me for two hours talking about eating disorders. So. Oh, yeah, that's challenging. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, and it's right before lunch. I exactly. thought about that. I was like, oh, yeah. right before lunch. Yeah, yeah they have free food today. So. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you.